The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weary or weak. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even the youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Just yesterday, I was in my kitchen with my wife, and we were kind of talking about whatever had gone on the day before and that day and just catching up. And I looked up on our cupboards and I realized that above every one of our cupboards in our kitchen are all of our Christmas decorations still. <laughs> and I said, hey, given the fact that we're this close to March, it, it, would it be wise for us to pull those decorations down? And she said, yeah, I guess I just hadn't really thought about it. And when I say decorations, I mean, it's like the, the, the Christian housewives version of G.I. Joe sets, right? There, there's all these little houses and they've got little vehicles and little skater people figurines and little trees and they all light up and they've been running nonstop since December, whatever. So most of the lights are burnt out actually now. Uh, I'll get to figure out how to replace those next year. Or, or not. And uh, <laughs> uh, along with that, though, we were talking about Christmas decorations. Our kids love Christmas and they love decorations. One of the things that they enjoy are snow globes. Uh, I was given this snow globe recently and you just kind of hold the, the button here and it, it has a fan inside that'll light up and kicks it around. But my kids, my kids love snow globes. And the thing I realized about snow globes too is that there's this beautiful image at the center of the snow globe. But so often when you're constantly moving and you're changing directions and you've got a lot going on, the sediment, in this case, the glitter, kicks up and spins all around and you can't really see with clarity the entirety or the totality of what the image is inside. I know that there is, in this case, a village a snow-covered village and trees, but you miss the details, the important details because of all the sediment that is in the, in the air that, that, that is in the way impeding your vision. And I wonder how many of us, if we're honest, in our own lives, would have to admit, maybe not readily, but necessarily, have to admit that because of the amount of stuff in our lives, the constant change, the constant motion, the constant commotion, the constantly adding things to my calendar and adding finances to our budget and adding relationships to our community and adding events for our kids. And if we, if we sat long enough and really took time to reflect, how many of us would honestly have to admit that when it comes to our faith, and even other areas of our lives, but I'm just going to talk about our faith this morning. When it comes to our faith, though we have an understanding that there's this great image of what our faith is designed to look like. And I'm going to talk about our created purpose later on in the message. But that because of all of the stuff in our lives, we lose sight we lose a clear sight picture where we can no longer determine the forest for the trees because of all the things that we have going on in our lives. We started this Stronger series eight weeks ago today. And it is a reflection of what we feel God is calling us to as a church in 2018. We began to pray and seek the Lord's will for our church this year. And we really felt like the thing that we heard over and over again collectively was that this year is a year of growth that we're to grow in our relationships with God and others, that we're to grow in our knowledge and our understanding, that we're to grow in our faith, that we're to grow as individual and as a community of believers. So in response to what we felt God calling us to, we launched this, what is turned into be a 12-week sermon series that we've entitled Stronger with the intention of growing stronger in our faith. Seven weeks ago, 
we kicked off the series, or eight weeks ago today, with the first sermon being a message on studying the Word of God. That in order for us to grow stronger in our faith, we've got to add to our faith and to our lives the study of God's Word. The second of the message series was that of prayer. Growing stronger in our faith requires adding prayer as a priority to our faith and life. The third week was a a message on meditation. That unlike Eastern religions and mysticism, it's not about emptying our minds at all. It's really about filling our minds on the word of God and meditating on his precepts day and night. Adding meditation to grow stronger in our faith. And then the fourth week we looked at the discipline of solitude, which is, uh, if I can say very candidly, maybe one of the top messages, favorite messages that I've ever preached at myself, Psalm 4610. And we looked at the idea of, that, that solitude isn't a, a position, but it's a place in our, it's, it's not a place rather, but it's a position in our heads and our hearts. That we need to add to our lives the ability to be still and know that he is God, regardless of our circumstances. And then in week five, Pastor Richard tackled the spiritual discipline of confession, that we need to add confession to our lives in order to grow stronger in our faith. The sixth week, Kevin Barnhill, one of our elders, gave a message on spiritual discipline of service, that we need to add service to our lives as we continue to grow stronger. And then finally, last week, I had Pastor Ricky Soma, who is our men's conference, step up men's conference speaker come and he gave a message on the spiritual discipline of secrecy. And we're going to touch on that a little bit today. But the one common denominator that all seven of those messages have, that the message today doesn't have, is that each one of those messages was growing in our faith or growing stronger in our faith by addition. By adding elements to our daily lives that are designed and geared toward helping us reflect and think on how to intentionally grow stronger in our faith. Today, today the message is the spiritual discipline of simplicity, and I want to propose to you that we are going to grow stronger in our faith. It's addition by subtraction. Addition by subtraction. I want to, I want to clear up any misconceptions right up front that might lend themselves to believe that the discipline or the spiritual discipline of simplicity is the same as the vow of poverty. They actually have really nothing to do with one another. Now, I do believe that there are some who are called to take a vow of poverty, and I respect that. I truly do. But throughout Scripture, we see Jesus talks about finances more than he does heaven and hell combined and the provisions of God. And we see countless individuals that God uses who had earthly possessions, though that was never supposed to be their priority. So today, I'm not going to give you a message at great length about selling all your possessions and giving all your money to the church or giving it to the poor. That's not the point of today. The point of today is to address the issue that I think we all have, and that is that we have a clear understanding, conceptually, of what our faith is called to look like, of what matters most for all eternity. But we lose sight of what matters most because we're constantly moving, we're constantly changing, we're constantly adding things to our lives that convolute and stir up and kick up the sentiment, that, that, the sediment rather, that, that, that takes away from a clear understanding of what we're called to. So today I hope that by the end of our time together today, you'll be encouraged and challenged and educated to make conscious decisions to eliminate some things in your lives, in your schedules, in your finances, in your relationships, in general, all with the intention of growing stronger in your faith through the spiritual discipline of simplicity, addition by way of subtraction. Would you grab your Bibles and open to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6? And if you don't have your Bible, I would encourage you to raise your hand. One of our elders or ushers would rather uh, like to come and bring you a Bible. And these are a gift that we have from us to you. The Bible is yours to have and to keep. We use them every week. We turn in them every week and throughout the week. So with your Bible open to Matthew chapter 6, if you're still looking for it, start in the middle of your Bible, turn to your right, and you should hit it in just a couple of, couple of books. Matthew is the first of four Gospels, and it's where we're going to spend a majority of our time today. It's also where Pastor Icky left off last week. 
In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is well on his way in his Sermon on the Mount. He has begun his public ministry with, a, with a, the first sermon ever recorded. He's gone up on the side of a mountain. And here at his feet sit his disciples. And, and below the disciples at the base of the mountain is a conglomerate of individuals that span multiple regions, multiple ethnicities, and genders, and demographics, and Jesus is giving this incredible sermon, this challenge, this call to action. And everything up until this point, Jesus, Jesus is, is talking about the byproduct of our faith. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you will be filled. It's all about actions that lead to a response or to the movement of God in their life. Last week, Pastor Ricky talked about when you give. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And when you pray, that you shouldn't go out to the street corners like the Pharisees and those who want to be recognized for their big, eloquent speech. That when you fast, that you shouldn't act like you're in a state of mourning where you're dumping ashes on yourself and wearing burlap. But the adjective, or the, the, the key word there that I want to focus on, the precursor to all the things that Jesus says about these three spiritual disciplines, which we're actually going to cover through the rest of the series, is the word when. It presupposes that as a byproduct of your relationship with Jesus Christ, and in, in a desire to honor God, that the fully devoted follower of Christ is going to add these elements to their lives. He uses the word when seven times between chapter 6, verse 1, and verse 18. When you pray, when you fast, when you give. This is a presupposed idea that says because of who you are in Christ, these are, these are byproducts. It's just natural. It's what you do. But here in verse 19, his approach changes, and it moves from Actions that influence our attitudes and address attitudes that are reflective in our actions. Let me say that again. When you study this sermon and you look at Matthew 5 all the way up to 618, right before what we're going to study today, that is about actions that influence our attitudes. But at 619, Jesus flips the script on the disciples and it becomes less about actions and more about attitudes that will influence our actions. So we're going to read together just a few short verses. We're going to stop and we're going to spend some time reflecting on them. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, and before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let me pray. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to share. If you don't show up right now, this is going to be little more than a, 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 an ill attempt at a motivational speech. But when you show up, when your name is lifted up and you draw all people unto you, Father, you have the ability and the desire to change the composition of our hearts. And I pray that in these few moments we have together, Father, that, that my voice would be silenced and your voice would be heard. I pray for the strength to get through this message. I pray for hearts and minds that are open and receptive to your word. And I pray that I would preach with clarity and integrity. God, I pray that you would meet us where we're at and that you would take us into where you want us to go. And that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's study this together. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, on the spiritual discipline of simplicity. Jesus says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Jesus starts this attitude reflective of actions with a word picture that is common to all, regardless of age or demographic or socioeconomic status, 
everybody in that community understood the importance of the harvest, the significance to their well-being, their health, their nutrition, their, their sustenance. They also understood the significance of collecting and storing because this was a big part of their commerce. And the imagery that Jesus uses isn't new to them. This is thousands of years old. In fact, we can go all the way back to the story of Joseph, coat of many colors, being thrown into a cistern and then sold off and arrested falsely, held under false imprisonment, in prison for three years, giving the, the dream to, uh, the interpreting the dream to, to, to Pharaoh, where he says, look, there's going to be seven years of, of excess and then seven years of famine. And, what we need to do is over the next seven years, the king needs to store up as much as he can. And, and in the famine, not only will our community be cared for, but others will come to us for care and we'll be able to, to trade with them and we'll be able to care for them as well. We'll be able to look out for the least of these, the, the lesser then. And so they had stored up in these grain bins, these silos, the excess from the harvest. People understand storage. People understand storage all too well. So when Jesus says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal, I wanted us to think about, just, I just did some research about how we as Americans view storage. And I hope that you're as puzzled and surprised at what I learned as I am. So I'm going to share some interesting facts with you about storage. I don't know the last time you researched storage units or storage in the U.S., but let me share some interesting facts with you guys. Did you know that since 1800, Americans' standard of living has increased by over 2,500%? Did you know that since 1820, the gap between the richest person and the poorest person, the socioeconomic status divide between the wealthiest and the poorest per capita was four to one, four to one. Today, that gap is greater than 20 to one and it is felt most in the United States of America where Americans are the top 1%. Did you know that over 40% of the rest of this world or nearly half of the world lives on less than $2 every day. And so if you're like me and you stopped at scooters on the way to church this morning to, de to, to, to devour their delicious coffee, you spent more today on your way to church. And in fact, I would argue you spent more in fuel getting from scooters to church than what more than 50% of the rest of the world will make today in income. According to a 2012, now this is six years outdated, but according to a 2012 American health study, research found that money, money is the number one stressor in American life today. The reason this is significant is because up until this point, it was communication. It was relationships. And money was the top three, the top tier. These are also three of the top reasons for divorce. Communication and finances. And what I would encourage you to think about then is, man, if, if this is the, money is the number one stressor in American life today. And you have to understand too that stress plays a big impact on your physical well-being. Let me give you an example. Sometimes, even inadvertently, for the last three, four weeks, three weeks leading up to this last week, I went nonstop. I was on vacation with my family. I spent the first three days of that vacation in the hospital with my daughter who was very ill. And then we felt like we had to make up our vacation time on the back end. And so we went like crazy and got back, went to the men's conference. Uh, not only did we go to the men's conference, but I played basketball. And the way Steve Lacey put the brackets, my team played three more games than every other team out there. Uh, wore me down. It's the only reason we lost. <laughs> 
We took second. I had been going and going and going and going. And then Pastor Icky was around, and I just, I was going nonstop, 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 nonstop. And Tuesday, I started sneezing, thinking, oh, I just got allergies. Wednesday, I woke up with the wonderful influenza, which I have not had in seven years. I forgot the effect. So today is the first day I feel half human. And it wasn't because I was stressed out, but it was because of how much I had going on in my life. It was creating stress in my life, which weakened my immune system and caused me to get sick. And, and when I get sick, I'm a big baby. I don't get sick often. You can ask my wife, Stacy. I truly don't get sick that often. But if my temperature, if my body temperature changes even one degree, you would think that I was dying of multiple gunshot wounds. <laughs> like I lay there and I just, I just, it's, I hate to admit how pathetic I must look to my wife. As I'm laying in bed, this six foot one, 240 pound guy, that, that, that it, she just looks, and I'm like, can you please give me some water? Can you, whatever I say, I don't even know what I say. This is how delirious I was. I laid in bed this week. I don't remember what day it was. And I watched curling for 30 minutes. <laughs> and at the end of 30 minutes, I realized I had no more clue of what was going on 30 minutes later as I did when it started. I mean, I don't even want to talk about it. So the reason I'm sitting today is because I... Uh, I have a weakened immune system. I have a lower, lower energy today than normal. You get the decaffeinated version of Andrew. Some of you think this is refreshing. <laughs> Pastor Mark reminded me this morning to tell you not to get used to it. Uh, there are, I found this interesting too. There are over 58,000 storage facilities nationwide which is a collective of 235 billion square feet of space and an estimated $6.6 .6 billion spent on annual storage fees. I think the statistic is that just around $300 million will solve, oh, I'm standing up, aren't I? <laughs> will solve our water problem globally. For just over $300 million, we can tap clean wells and we can create systems, aqueducts and, and filtration systems that will provide clean water to the rest of the world that doesn't otherwise have access to clean water. I think for around $500 million, give or take, we solve the food crises globally. So let's just say 500 and 300, rough, rough guesses, I'll have to do some research in between to make sure that I'm pretty sure I'm accurate based on um, the 30-hour famine numbers every year that come out and, and, and um, the world hunger, the, the, the stuff we do with them, but less than $1 billion takes care of our global hunger problem and our global water problem. Less than $1 billion, yet annually Americans will spend $6.6 .6 billion dollars storing crap that they don't want anyway. I mean, I'm going to start preaching now. <laughs> How many of you, if you're honest, have stuff in your hand? Don't raise your hand and don't point at your wife right now. This is not a good time to do that. <laughs> this is not the spiritual discipline of confession for your wife. <laughs> confession. <laughs> if you're honest, how many of you think about your house and you realize you've got more junk than you know what to do with it. And you're not doing your kids any service. Like, they're not expecting you to hold on to everything you've ever had since 1872, waiting for you to die so they can go through it. <laughs> How many of you, if you're, I mean, they even have reality TV shows about storage wars. People who are going into these, 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 these lapsed payments uh, that people don't make for their junk. And you know why people don't make payment on their junk? Because it's junk. preach. And they go in and they start bidding wars about people's junk. I mean, if we're on, I, 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 my wife recently went through our kids' closets and our kids' storage units, our kids' basement, our kids' toy room, and threw out bags, took them to Goodwill. Bags, how many bags do you think? Yeah, eight bags? A lot. I mean, a 50-gallon bag, it's huge. Do you know how many of those toys my kids have asked about? Not one. And yet, we somehow find our value 
in junk. But Jesus says, Jesus says, don't store up, don't build silos for yourself, treasures here on earth. And we're going to see the word treasures is used, it, it, it's flipped here in just a moment. The word treasure here represents physical possessions. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. But instead, verse 20, store your treasures. Now, here's the second use of this word, treasures, acts of service. Treasures are the things that you do with your life, not what you do with your possessions. That's how this is used. So let me read it this way. Store up for yourselves the things that you do with your life in heaven. Oh, that reads different, doesn't it? When you're not concerned about crowns and jewels and cars and boats and houses and clothes and designer jeans and guys wearing jeans looking like they came out of the wives' closets, I got a couple pair. <laughs> when you're not consumed with what your neighbor thinks about you and what kind of lawnmower you have, is it a John Deere, or is it a Caterpillar, is it a what? When you're not consumed with the latest, greatest trends and fads going from Fitbit to Fitbit 2 to Fitbit 3 when you were never fit to begin with, uh, going <laughs> the Apple Watch 1 and 2 and 3 as though you're not already tied at the hip with your phone because we talked about that, didn't we? I can go back to that message if you want and talk about nine hour, nine hour and 51 minute average of usage on cell phones a day. Not, and that's just 18 to 40 year olds, not including the preteens and the over 40. Not that we don't have an idea. Listen, it reads different when you read it like this. Store your things that you do with your life, those are the treasures, in heaven. That's the clear picture. But that clear picture gets convoluted because we're constantly moving and changing and adding to our lives. So we have an idea of what it should look like, but we lose sight of it. You know, store these things up in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Because where the things that you do with your life, there it is again, treasure. Where what you do with your life, your acts of service, the things you do with your time, treasure, and talents, there the desires of your heart will also be. Let's talk about the heart for a moment. In Mark 10. Jesus is with his disciples and they're walking. And as they're walking, a rich man comes to him and he says, teacher, tell me, what do I need to do to inherit this? I've got an idea of what this looks like, of what this eternal life I've heard about looks like, but what do I have to do to inherit that? You see, his life had so much sediment in the air, he couldn't see clearly. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good, it's God. But if you want to inherit eternal life, then obey the commandments. Rationally thinking, he says, all right, which ones? I mean, the short list is 10 in Exodus 20. The longer list is 613. We'll go short list. Jesus only mentions six of the 10. Don't lie, don't steal, don't murder, don't commit adultery. Honor your mother and father. And the guy looks at his life and he says, hey, I've done that. I've not killed anybody. I've, I honor my mom and dad. I don't lie. I don't I'm a good guy. But he realizes there's still... He's still miles away from where he wants to be. He sees where he should be, but there still seems to be this sense of sentiment in the air. And so he says, but Jesus, tell me, what else must I do? I find that interesting because Jesus just told him what to do, but he doesn't leave well enough alone. He keeps questioning. Well, what do you mean? What, what else should I do? And Jesus says, all right, you really want to know? I mean, you're asking. You want to go all in on this? If you want to experience eternal life, then give everything, sell everything you've got, give it away to the poor, and come and follow me. And look at Mark, if you want to turn, you can. If not, that's okay, I'm going to read it to you. Mark chapter 10. It's just a few pages to your right. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 17. But I'm going to read verse 22. At this, the man's face fell. In other words, the attitude of his heart had a direct impact on his actions. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, Hey guys, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? 
This amazed them. But Jesus said again, dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples began to ask each other, then who can go get to heaven this way? And God, Jesus says, look, man alone cannot do it. But where God is involved, all things are possible. This is an issue of understanding our purpose. We all have a created purpose. I was talking to one of our staff members, one of our pastors this last week, and I was thinking about the message for this weekend, and we literally, I'm not exaggerating, up until about 7.50, we had a, an exit plan. Uh, if I wasn't going to be able to preach, uh, I felt much better first service because there was a doctor in the service. This service, if I go down... Kirk, you just come keep going. Just, just step over me and just keep going. But I was talking to, to one of our pastors about this message, and I, say, I said, look, in, in simplicity, in, in the spiritual discipline of simplicity, which is addition by subtraction, it boils down to understanding our created purpose. I want to I I give you creation <laughs> In, in, in one very, very short sentence, and I can elaborate at, at length, but the shortest version of our created purpose is this, to know God fully and to make God fully known. That's it. That's why we exist. Every one of us has an innate desire in us because we are created in the image of God to know God fully and to make him fully known. You don't have to look beyond Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3 to understand the significance of knowing God fully. That's the design. Now, there's a lot to it, right? Well, we're created to worship God. Yeah, yeah, but that's a part of knowing God because when you know God, the natural byproduct of knowing God and the significance of God is, is an act of worship. So if our created purpose is to know God fully, the second part of that is to make God fully known. Those are Jesus' last recorded words in Scripture. Matthew 28, Acts chapter 1 8. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Our created purpose is to know God fully and to make God fully known. And, and, and so you, you ask how this rich man came to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he gives him a clear explanation. And he says, well, that's not good enough. What else must I do? Jesus is not addressing matters of money. That has been so misappropriated throughout scripture. People assume that that passage is all about money. Pastors, intended or not, have used that to abuse congregants, beating them into submission, thinking that they have to sell everything they own and give it to the church. If that's God's call on your life, I want you to talk to Pastor Mark after service. But that's not what this is about. We are all called to give and to give sacrificially of the first fruits. That's true. Jesus does talk about money more than he does heaven and hell combined. That's true. But why? It's an issue of faithfulness and service. He says God cannot serve both God and mammon or money, things of this, possessions of this world. So this is a matter of the heart. The Bible says that when he heard the things of Jesus, his face fell and he walked away sad. In other words, his emotions were affected because of his attitudes, which were not followed by actions. He was so caught up in all the things he had done, in all the commotion, all the hard work he had put into building the life that he wanted to live the way he wanted to live it, that he lost sight of what mattered most. And I just wonder if you're honest, how many of you this morning would have to confess, Pastor, I've lost sight of my created purpose. There's so much sediment in the air. There's so much confusion around me. There's so many things I've worked so hard to do. I, I, my, my calendar is confusing. My relationships are confusing. My finances are confusing. And, and I've just lost sight of what matters most. I've lost sight of my created purpose, which is to know God fully and to make God fully known. And you look at this. You jump back to Matthew chapter 6 in verse 22. And it says, your eye, your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. 
But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. This is an issue of familiarity. This is an issue of the importance and the power of light in culture. This is a group of people that would have built lanterns. They would have taken cloth and they would have wrapped it around um, a, 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 a metal mound. And they would have doused it with olive oil. And they would have carried it around either by hand, like, like this, or they would have put it on a stick that they could put out in front of them. And in the city streets, there would have been these lamp posts, these wooden posts that had a stake sticking out from them that they would have used a stick to hang these lanterns on. And everybody knows that lamps or lanterns give light to darkness so you can see where you're going. Here's the thing. I think some of us get really comfortable in darkness. I know I've done it, even in my own house. We've been here just over a year, and I've, I've walked around at night long enough to kind of know where I'm going, and especially from my bed to the bathroom. The older I get, the more frequent that becomes. And I, 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 but, but can I tell you something? I feel like at 40 years old, uh, I have to have a nightlight. And, and it's not because I'm scared of the dark. It's because I have children. And what I mean by that is, when you have five daughters, four under the age of 12, you get out of bed, and somehow, when you lay down at night, to when you get up to go to the restroom some two or three hours later, every doll that your daughter has ends up in the middle of your floor, and you're stepping on Barbie heads. One of the worst just recently happened. I was laying in bed. I got up to go to the restroom. The kids are gone. I'm like, this is brilliant. I'm just going to go to the bathroom. I'll get right back. As I'm walking, I know exactly how to get around my bed and everything. I step on one of my daughter's hairbrushes. And I don't mean the kind of hairbrush that has the air pocket that's supposed to be warm and fine, like the bit. No, I'm talking about the hairbrush that they give you in prison. (laughs) I step on that, and I almost lost my salvation. Started speaking in foreign tongues of man. (laughs) But not only that, my kids, they each have a bedroom, they each have beds that have blankets and pillows and we have wood floors in our room. If it were up to them, they would sleep on our wood floor. We would do okay in a one bedroom apartment. I'm convinced of that. They only use our bathroom in our, in our master bedroom and they want to sleep on our wood floors or in our bed with us. The number of times I roll out of bed not knowing the bodies on the floor. And so I need light to give direction to the steps that I take for my own health and well-being. You and I need light to give direction to live our lives for what matters most. The light is the light of Jesus in a dark world. And the light sheds light, pun intended, on our priorities. What I love about the snow globe is that it's actually got some electronics attached to it. And if you just hold down a button, It illuminates, and there's a fan inside that kicks up the, uh, what are these things called? The glitter. The stuff that you can never get out of your carpet or your clothes. Uh, I just just love that. This is a great reminder for me. That I often lose sight of what matters most in faith because I've got so much going on around me. I'm constantly moving. I'm, getting sick this last week honestly was a blessing. I was forced to just lay in bed and slow down. And even resting, like that's a chore for me. I had to force myself to sleep sometimes. But it was, it was good for me because it gave some clarity. I think we think that the more we do, the more we have, the more we are. Jesus teaches the spiritual discipline of addition by way of subtraction. The spiritual discipline of simplicity draws us back to 
our faith. So let me close with the big so what. It's this. Simplicity is about addition by subtraction, which is setting aside those things that keep us from an even greater focus on God. Simplicity is a spiritual discipline of addition by subtraction, which intentionally is making conscious effort and decisions to set aside those things that keep us from a greater relationship with God. Because in the end, if if it's true that our created purpose is to know God fully and to make God fully known, then that's really all that matters and matters more than anything else. So everything else that we're doing that needs to be reevaluated, it has to be reevaluated. How you spend your money, it needs to be reevaluated. And you have to ask yourself, listen, in this area, there's no gray area in this. If it's true that we're created to know God fully and to make God fully known, then that means that everything we do, literally, there's no ambiguity in this. Every decision we make, everything we do is going to do one of two things with regards to our created purpose. It's either going to push us toward fulfilling our purpose or it's going to pull us away from our created purpose. So ask yourself with honesty this morning, are my relationships driving me toward fully knowing God and making God fully known or is it pulling me apart? My calendar, if I look at my, my pocketbook or my, my computer or my phone, if I look at my calendar, are the things that inhabit my calendar, are they pushing me closer to my, my purpose which is to know God fully and to make God fully known or are they pulling me away from my created purpose? my finances am I a part of the 6.6 billion dollar problem am I a part of the 238 billion square foot problem where I'm storing up for myself things on earth that will not last are those things that I care about the possessions the boats the cars the houses the clothes the, the perception of people are those things pushing me toward fulfilling my created purpose which is to know God fully and to make God fully known or are they detracting and pulling away from my created purpose you have to ask yourself with honesty how you're doing in these areas of life because until we get this right and I hate to be so black and white matter of fact about this but church the truth is until we get this right this is what I believe Paul says when he says work out your salvation with fear and trembling salvation is a gift of God given freely but it's not free requires effort and intentionality and so we have to ask ourselves and wrestle with this this morning if the only thing that matters is our is our created purpose and knowing God fully and making God fully known then the things in my life either add to that or take away from that and in order for us to grow as mature followers of Jesus fully devoted followers of Jesus we have to add to our faith addition by subtraction through simplicity where do you need to simplify your life